it's Rav. Welcome to the Everyday Investor TV show, the hottest investment show in the world. That's right. I said it. I don't care who knows it. This show is designed to help us grow our money. You see, often the challenge is we take our precious time, we go to work, which is a blessing if you have a job, we make money in order to eat. We take our time, we go to work, we get a paycheck in order to provide. But imagine a life where money could make you money, you could work a little less if you wanted to, and then you could spend time with family, friends, you could engage in a purpose greater than yourself. So every single week, we bring um, uh, really uh, smart people on the show to teach us different investment strategies. Speaking of which, go to everydayinvestor.com, look at the uh, upcoming summit for the first time in 20 years. We are going live and in person. Um, it's a no-brainer to attend. Uh, we've made it really, really uh, cheap. It includes a light breakfast, a lunch, yada, yada, yada. Um, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Coming up, Rachel Oliver comes on the show as a guest host, answering all your questions when it comes to the rent-to-own strategy. It's a great question. And what I'd like to say is that of, out of all the investing strategies out there, I find rent-to-owns to be the lowest possible risk. Hi, it's Darren Mitchell from Control and Compound. If you're a real estate investor or business owner, you know the cookie cutter approach to financial planning doesn't work for you. You've gotta be in control of your money. You've gotta save and store your money differently than other people. At Control and Compound, we are the wealth coaches for real estate investors and business owners. We show you how to save your money, grow your money tax-free, multiply your money tax-free, and spend it tax-free. To learn more, please check us out at controllingcompound.com forward slash everyday investor, where viewers of this show get a complimentary education session. Hey, it's Rav. A few years ago, I learned how to trade stock options by taking the Theta Trading course. My son, my friends, myself, all of us benefited immensely by applying their strategies, and I want you to have that same benefit by taking their course as well. I'm not receiving any monetary benefit whatsoever by telling you this. It's just that, as you know, I believe that knowledge mitigates risk. Visit their site to find out more. Terry Lynn Legault from Canada's Mortgage Choice here. Have you been working with a bank and they've told you that they can't get you approved for purchasing a mortgage because you have bad credit, because you've gone bankrupt in the past? Have you been working to improve those things and still not getting anywhere? Did you know that there is alternative lenders who will look at these things and take them into consideration differently? Meaning that you might have to pay a higher interest rate now, but we can work with that, get you into a home and revisit that in a year. If this is something that sets home with you and you think we can help you with, call us today at Canada's Mortgage Choice. Hey, it's Rachel Oliver from Clover Properties. I'm so excited to be guest hosting this show today. And over the next 20 minutes, we're going to cover some of the most common questions I get about real estate investing and specifically about the rent to own strategy. So question number one, what is rent to own? Well, it all starts with the people. In many other real estate investing strategies, we always hear about people thinking, where am I gonna buy a property? What kind of a property is it going to be? But when it comes to rent to own, you wanna start with the people. And these are people generally who have been declined for a mortgage by the banks. They might have 5% down, but maybe they started a new job recently and they don't have the job history the banks are looking for. Or maybe they went through a divorce, so they have a little bit of matrimonial debt on their credit report and the banks are looking at that saying well you can't quite qualify for a mortgage today or maybe they have a student loan or maybe they're recovering from a bankruptcy recently whatever it is it's tarnishing their credit and the banks are looking at that with a very negative lens so rent to own becomes a really good option for these people they have to have a great job and they have to have some money saved up usually five percent and then a private investor can step in buy a property on the open market that these people want to rent to own, and ultimately you have a rent to own scenario. And really what makes this strategy so unique is that the rent to own process is designed to help the family that wants to own a home become mortgage ready. Today they have only 5% saved up, and they need to rent to own over two or three or four years to become mortgage ready. So the investor that's buying the property is staying on title for the duration of the rent to own deal. And of course, it wouldn't be a great real estate investing strategy if it wasn't win-win. 
What do I mean by that? Win-win means the family that's renting to own is building up a bigger down payment month over month. So their initial 5% will double throughout the rent to own term. On the flip side, the investor is generating cash flow and they have a motivated tenant in the property because that initial 5% can add up to 20, 30, $40,000. And that's a lot of skin in the game for the investor that's holding title. So the home buyer is building up a bigger down payment. The investor is holding title and generating cash flow and additional profits because they're selling the property to this family at the end of a designated term and they're selling it at a profit. So the investor is making a profit from cash flow and a profit from the sale. The home buyer is building up a bigger down payment. They're getting time to build up better credit. And in the process, there's a little bit of equity being built up through the rent to own two, three or four year term. Another question I get is who is the ideal person to rent to own? Well, Everything with rent to own starts with affordability. What is the household income of the family that needs to rent to own? And what is their initial down payment? Do they have 5% saved up? So depending on what market they're trying to buy in, we really need to do a stress test to make sure that they can keep up with the monthly payments. And in most markets across Ontario, we're dealing with at least on average about $100,000 household income. So the husband makes 50,000, the wife makes 50,000, combined they make about $100,000. And with that type of an income, they would be able to afford roughly a $500,000 property, provided that they have about 20, $25,000 saved up as a minimum down payment. And that is how we define who is a great fit for the rent own strategy. Here's an example. Dave and Sheila came to us saying that they got declined by the banks for a mortgage. And primarily that was because Dave recently started his own business and he just didn't have enough of a track record showing self-employed income. Sheila had pretty good employment. She was working for an airline and combined they were making about $140,000. Now they have a small child, so there's of course expenses associated with daycare and children's activities, but nonetheless, they still made a great income of about $140,000 with a $20,000 thousand dollar down payment and when we looked at the numbers and looked at what their day-to-day -day expenses were we essentially designated a purchasing budget for them of about four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars and they got to go on the open market shop with a real estate agent and find a home that made sense for them in an area that they loved that was in great close proximity to their family which is where they wanted to be so that's a perfect example of the type of people that we work with when we help them rent to own and here's another example. Rod and Cassandra came to us saying that they can't qualify for a mortgage because they were just carrying a little bit too much debt and they needed some runway to pay it down. So they saved $30,000 for a down payment and based on their income, we were able to qualify them to purchase a $680,000 home. And they wanted to be in Angus, Ontario. So they had a fairly healthy income and a decent down payment, but they still need about three years to pay down that debt and build up a bigger down payment. So we put together a 36 month rent to own term for them. So in 2026, Cassandra and Rod will become homeowners at the end of the rent to own term. Another question that I get is who is the ideal investor for a rent to own deal? And this is a really cool question because it really all starts with what is the objective of that investor? Do they want to make a lot of cash flow or do they want to just grow their money? Unfortunately, you can't do them in tandem as well as we'd like, but there's still a decent opportunity. So I have one investor who came to me named Monica and she wanted to grow her capital. She didn't really care for cash flow because her and her husband have amazing jobs. And really what we're looking at is an investor who has great jobs and great credit and they're able to qualify for a mortgage with a 20% down payment. Because when you're dealing with a rent to own, you're technically buying an investment property and the banks are looking for the investor to have a 20% down payment plus all the closing costs required. So Monica came to us saying she can qualify for a mortgage up to $700,000, which is fantastic because there are a lot of first time home buyers who are shopping exactly into that price point and we can match them easily. So Monica went to her bank, got qualified and came back to us. And Monica said, I don't really care for the cash flow. I want to maximize my profits. And on average, a rent to own can generate about 25% return on investment per year. 
Now, in Monica's case, we can bump it up to about 28, 29% because we're putting, into, uh, putting her into a deal with home buyers that are coming to the table with a bigger initial down payment. Remember, a tenant buyer can enter the rent to own process with 5% down minimum. However, there are people who have a little bit more saved up. They might have six or seven, or in some cases, 10% saved up, and they still can't get a mortgage. So that would be Monica's ideal family for rent to own. So we would match Monica with a home buyer that's entering a rent to own program with an above average initial down payment. Because what really is happening is that Monica has to qualify for financing. She's getting leverage from the banks for 80%. Well, the family that's renting to own is also coming in with 10%. So Monica is really only tying up 10% of her money, which gives her higher leverage. And higher leverage gives higher profits when it comes to rent to owns. So the cash flow side of a rent to own deal comes from a home buyer having 5% down initially when they start the rent to own process. And because rent to own is really designed to help them build a bigger down payment, kind of like a forced savings, they have to pay over and above the monthly rent something towards each month towards a bigger down payment. And that can be $500, $700, $800 a month. And that extra over and above forced savings that will benefit them at the end of the rent to own so they can qualify for a mortgage also benefits the investor that's holding title because it translates into above average cash flow. So the average rent to own deal sees anywhere from seven to $1,100 a month in cash flow after all expenses. Another question is, are all rent-to-owns created equal? Well, it's a short answer. There are two ways of doing rent-to-owns. You can start with the people first, or you can start with the property first. We have experienced much more success starting with the people, where the people are qualified for a budget, they get to go house hunting on the open market to pick a property that they love, and we help them buy that property through our investor channel. When you start with a property that you currently own and try to find people for it, it can be a much longer, more tedious process. And to be honest, I think the success rate is questionable as well. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. The mortgage world has changed. Has your advice? Are you looking for a modern approach to your mortgage planning process? Advice tailored to your unique, ever-changing circumstances? Whether you're upsizing, downsizing, purchasing, or refinancing, the Kyle Ford Mortgage Team works with individuals and companies to custom tailor the right mortgage product for you. Working with a wide selection of lenders, we're here to serve our clients and help them achieve their real estate and retirement goals. Contact the Kyle Ford Mortgage Team today. Canada's mortgage choice. Hey guys, Omar Khan here from Data Trading. I'm really excited to be part of the Everyday Investor Summit, Sunday, October 29th, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Myself, Rav Tour, and six other industry professionals will be talking all about wealth creation. Yours truly will be talking about options. I'll be there to answer your questions all day. Tickets are only $197. We're expecting a full house. That does include a light breakfast and a full lunch. And as Warren Buffett says, the more you learn, the more you earn. So I hope to see you there. Welcome back, it's Rachel Oliver. Today, I'm talking about the most common questions I get about real estate investing and specifically the rent-to-own strategy. And by the way, if you have some burning questions and you wanna get answers to them, join me at the Everyday Investor Summit on October 29th. So, one of the questions I get from a lot of investors who already own properties is that, I have a property, the renter is moving out, I'm not really cash flowing if I rent it out to someone else, can I convert it to a rent to own? So the short answer is yes. However, the first thing we need to consider is what is the fair market value of that property? If that property is priced beyond what the entry level price point is for the average family that needs help to rent to own, you might be out of luck because the entry level price tag is really, really key to determine affordability. Remember, although you're starting with a property first, you have to find people who can afford to make the monthly payments on that property. And that, in my view, is kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. I have a hard time finding people for that type of a deal, but it is absolutely doable. The first thing you wanna consider is what is the fair market value of your property? on the open market. 
and you have to be fair, by using an appraisal. And then the next thing you want to do is consider what will it take for someone to be able to afford to buy a property like that when you consider the stress test. So the quick math is usually what is the household income multiplied by four and what initial down payment do they have? Now, I wanna give you a really important tip here. Zero down payments in a rent to own do not work. It's not a win-win. The investor that's holding title doesn't benefit because the family stepping into the rent to own arrangement doesn't have enough skin in the game. And the family that's renting to own is stepping into a deal that doesn't give them a strong enough springboard to build up that down payment savings through the rent to own process. So you're already starting behind the eight ball in that type of an arrangement. So. The family has to be able to afford the fair market value of the property that you currently own and they have to have at least 4 or 5% down payment against that fair market value. And then you can talk to a mortgage professional to see what it'll really take for that family to become mortgage ready. We as investors don't know how to read credit reports, but mortgage professionals do. So talk to a mortgage professional, have them review the credit report of the people that you are trying to rent to own your home to and see how long this family will need. Will they need a two-year term, a three-year term, or a four-year term? And then see what that mortgage agent will be able to do for them to help them become mortgage ready. Having a third party deal with those logistics is really important to ensure that you are providing providing a win-win scenario and everybody gets ahead through this arrangement. So another great question is, what is the downside? What are the risks when it comes to having a rent-to-own property? It's a great question. And what I'd like to say is that of, out of all the investing strategies out there, I find rent-to-owns to be the lowest possible risk because you really have a fairly invested tenant in the mix. They're coming in with twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars Remember, the qualification criteria for the home buyer is actually quite high. They have to have a substantial household income. They have to have twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 saved up, and they hand that over to the investor as the initial down payment before they commit to the rent-to-own term. So you have a fairly invested tenant, but of course we don't have a crystal ball. And sometimes life throws everyone a curve ball. Maybe the family that's in the rent to own arrangement decides that they're going to get separated or divorced, or there's a job loss. Life happens, I get it. And in this case, as the investor, you have quite a bit of security. Remember, you're on title. As the investor, you have security because when you buy the property, you take title and you hold title for the full duration of the rent-to-own term. Plus, you have that family's initial down payment. So they gave 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars at the start, and that money stays with the investor if the family defaults and cannot complete their commitment to the rent-to-own term. But wait, there's more. The tenant is always giving a down payment credit every month. We call that that forced savings. And that forced savings can translate into six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month. And that forced savings also stays with the investor. It's not refundable if the tenant buyer defaults in this arrangement. So the investor gets to keep the down payment credits that were presented at the beginning and accumulated through the monthly payments. And the investor, of course, benefits from any equity and any mortgage pay down that has happened during the rent to own term. So all in all, there's a lot of security for the investor side of the equation. But of course, we always want to lead with precautions. So how do you prevent the downside? The downside in a rent to own is easily prevented. Remember in the first question I talked about who is the ideal family to rent to own. And that's people with a really solid household income that is consistent with where the real estate market values are today. And also that family has at least a 5% down payment saved up to put into the deal. So we start with the people. This is a strategy that starts with the people because it's the people that pay on time. It's the people that maintain the, pro the property and it's the people that comply with the contracts. So to mitigate risks, you have to have the right people in the rent to own agreement. Another question I get from a lot of real estate investors, especially the ones that are just starting out, is what is the difference between a rent to own property and a rental property? And which one do I go for first? So the main difference with a rent to own property is that you're going to be selling it at a predetermined date at a predetermined price. And usually that's about three or four years out. And we generally price the property at about a 5% annualized depreciation three or four years out. So you're kind of capped in terms of what you're selling this property for. 
When you own a rental property, well, the property values go up and you as the investor can benefit from that equity and you can keep that property as long as you want, cash out on that equity or keep it growing. You have a lot more flexibility. And the main difference is when you're renting a property, you have people in there that are paying you first and last month's rent. They're not really invested and they're really not committed. Plus, you're on the hook for all the maintenance and repairs hoopla that comes with owning a residential rental property. With rent to own, you have home buyers in the mix. They've given you a 20, 30, $40,000 down payment. They have pride of ownership because they picked this property and they're on contract to maintain it. And many of them, add love to that property. They put a lot of TLC, they do a lot of cosmetic upgrades to make the property their own, just like most homeowners do. And because of that, they're much more emotionally connected. So they're financially invested, they're emotionally connected to that property, and you as the investor don't have the typical tenant and toilet hassles. What you do have is transparency and predictability into what your profits are going to look like. You know tangibly every month what your cash flow is going to look like, for the next three or four years. And you're never gonna have to worry about those pesky phone calls to come and fix a leaky toilet because the tenants that are renting to own are on the hook for all of those maintenance and repairs fixes. So it gives you a lot of peace of mind with tremendous amount of profit and a lot of purpose when it comes to real estate investing. Another great question I get from investors who are interested in doing rent-to-owns is, what is the process? What's really involved in setting up a rent-to-own deal? And as I mentioned earlier, you can start with the property first and find the people, but you have to qualify them and make sure that they have the initial down payment and talk to a mortgage professional that will help plan the, the journey for that home buyer and how they're gonna exit the rent-to-own deal. That strategy sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't. And I don't really love that hit or miss approach. So the way we do it starts with the people, as I mentioned earlier. So we screen the people. We determine what can they truly afford based on the debt load that they're carrying, based on their lifestyle, and of course their household income and initial down payment. And then we determine their affordability. If they give us the thumbs up for that affordability, they get to go house hunting. They're shopping the open market. They're they're looking on the MLS and they're working with a real estate agent and they're really trying to find a property that gives them those butterflies, a property that they're emotionally connected to. When they find a property that they love, we run the numbers again to let them know what they can expect their monthly payments to look like and what their buy price is going to be at the end of the rent to own term. Again, we're looking for those thumbs up. And when we get those thumbs up, that's when we purchase the property. A Clover Properties investor actually steps in and negotiates the purchase. That is really the only time the investor is in the driver's seat. The rest of the time, it's pretty much a passive strategy. And we're also looking for the property to be move in ready. We don't want properties that are um, you know, fixer uppers or have some major uh, repairs that need to be done to them in the next three to four years. We want a property that is almost turnkey in a great community, family friendly area that is going to go up in value. And we vet the property before we go to offer. And of course, we're paying fair market value. We never want to overpay for that property. And hopefully, we win the bid. And once the offer is accepted, the home buyer moves in, and on day one, the investor is collecting a cash flow check. And remember, cash flow check is pretty juicy, so it's a day to celebrate to get seven, eight hundred bucks landing in your bank account and knowing that you're helping a family get on the path to ownership through this strategy. And then the heavy lifting really begins when the family moves in. It's not a set it and forget it strategy for us, we're doing all the heavy lifting. For the investor, it is more of a passive strategy and set it and forget it. But somebody has to manage the people behind the scenes. And I think that this is the piece that we bring a lot of secret sauce to. We want to make sure that those people are staying on track, that they're hitting their milestones to become mortgage ready. And at the end, they're going to hit the date that's indicated in that contract and qualify for their own mortgage and take ownership of that property. And that's how you put together a winning rent to own strategy. Now, a lot of investors don't know all those moving pieces and they don't know how to get started. And that's where we come in. We handle all the heavy lifting behind the scenes and we truly represent the investor's interest to make it a win-win strategy for everyone involved. That's it for today. Until next time, back to you, Rav. And now it's time for our investing tip of the week. 
Hey, it's Darren Mitchell, Teaching Tip of the Week. I want to talk about Canada Pension Plan today, CPP. And I'm going to talk specifically about some of the things people don't know. So what is Canada Pension Plan? As opposed to old age security, Canada Pension Plan, you have to be working to, to, to qualify for Canada Pension Plan. While you're working and you're over 18, you contribute roughly 6% of your income up to a certain amount, and your employer contributes roughly 6%. So it's 6%, 6%, 6% for the employee and the employer. Now, if you're self-employed, you're the employee and the employer. So if you're self-employed and you're, and, you're, and you're taking a salary, you have to pay the 6% as the employee and the 6% as the employer. Now, over the lifetime of your working career before you retire, that's about $300,000 at today's rates, what you and your employer would contribute. Or if you were self-employed, the full $300,000 would be, a, would be contributed by you. If you're single and you die, what happens to all those contributions? They're gone. Nothing goes back to anyone that you care about or love. That money is just gone. So again, you got to be really careful if you're single that's not gonna really potentially help you. The other thing that people really aren't aware of is what if you're married? Everyone goes, well, if you're married, don't you, know, don't you get some of your partners or your spouses CPP? You do. If you're married, they have what they call a 60% survivor benefit. So what that means is if your spouse was making $1,000 a month in CPP, they die, you get 600. But there's a little asterisk here, something they don't tell you. And there's a maximum on how much you can get combined with yours and your spouse's. So I wanna talk about just regular everyday people. Like I'm gonna talk about a police officer and a nurse. I'm not talking massive salaries. I'm just talking people making 70, 80, 90 grand a year. So let's talk about those two people. They start working at 18, they contribute to CPP their entire lives. Okay? up till age 65 and they retire. Well, the maximum CPP that you can get is 1,307. So that police officer or that nurse contributing all along, they'd be eligible for the maximum CPP of 1,307. Okay, they contributed them and their employer roughly $300,000, great. 1,307 every month for the rest of their life. And you can take it early, you can take it late, but for today, let's just Pretend they took it at 65. Now what happens if they both have that 1307 and one of them dies the day after they turn 65? Well, we have a 60% survivor benefit, right? So they should get 60% of the 1307. But here's the part they don't tell you. The combined maximum that you're eligible for for CPP is 1313. $1,313, you're gonna get an extra $6 from your spouse when that spouse died. Canada Pension Plan is ideally designed for a wealthy individual with a stay-at-home spouse, two working partners. If you, have CP, PP, if you have CPP, don't die at 65, don't die till you're 90, then it's gonna work. But that's a hidden, another, again, a hidden tax that the government doesn't usually tell people about. That's it for today, can't wait to see you next time. And thank you guys for being on the show. Without you, we would not have one. Uh, make sure you go to everydayinvestor.com um, to watch this show again and in any others. Also, we've got the Everyday Investor Summit coming up. Um, yours truly and six other um, investor trainers will be there to spend a whole day teaching. Go to everydayinvestor.com and register that for that. That'll be in late uh, October. Until next time, we'll see you same place uh, next week. Same time next week. Honey, I love you. I'll be home soon. Thanks for watching, everyone.